discrimination is the biggest problem in football today. It's everybody's responsibility, I think, to get rid of discrimination. It's against all my, my principles of, uh, of life. We have to listen more. We have to speak to the ones who are on the pitch and who feel discrimination firsthand. You could hear some, uh, you know, some monkey song, some monkey noise. If you're doing nothing about it, I think you're part of the problem. I want to know what a white man thinks about it. Not so much what I think about it as a black man. You get angry? Sexism definitely still exists in football. As a woman, every day I have to prove that I'm good enough. If I would have been a man, I would have kissed my girlfriend, and now I'm a woman, I also kiss my girlfriend. I mean, it should not be different. I struggle myself, only wearing the LGBT captain band, and I can't imagine how tough it is for gay people. Everybody knows if you come out as gay, it will have an effect on the dressing room. I'm a football player, and I was a refugee. What do you see here? Bullet holes. Look at them. Why is this refugee girl taking so many headlines? Because I'm kicking ass, bitch. If everybody were as outraged about racism, and if everybody was as outraged about homophobia, if everybody was as outraged about the lack of investment in the women's game, that would be the most inspiring thing. Well, that was the trailer for Outrage, the documentary that came out earlier on this year. A fantastic one. If you've not watched it yet, I urge you to. And I'm sure after this discussion we're about to have, you're going to go straight over and download it if you've not seen it yet. Um, we're discussing discrimination in football based on that fantastic documentary. I'm Faye Carruthers, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Nadia Nadim, who you'll have just seen in the trailer just there, Denmark international and striker for Paris Saint-Germain, and Tom Hillier, founder of Shoot the Company, who, who made this fantastic documentary with UEFA. Hi to you both. How are you, Nadia? What was it like seeing yourself in the, on the big screen just then? Uh, hello, first. Um, well, I mean, um, it was good. It was good. I, I liked it. I think uh, it it sent a really strong message and I really enjoy that, even though I'm cursing a tiny bit, but <laughs> I'm like, point well, gets across. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute because I liked that curse. I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty, uh, pretty decent response, to be honest. Um, Tom, you obviously made the documentary. How, how did it come together in the first place? So um, Shoot the Companies worked with UA for since 2015. Um, and one of the projects we worked on from 2017 onwards was the Equal Game campaign, which um, I think anyone who's seen Champions League um, or Europa League will, will know that, that uh, campaign. Um, and that was very much a celebration of grassroots football players and showing the inclusivity of, of football and celebrating that really. Um, so off the back of the success of that award-winning campaign, we were talking to UEFA for about actually looking at the other side of, of football, where, where discrimination is a problem and, and actually tackling and discussing and raising those important issues of, of discrimination, essentially. So we'd done the kind of the, the feel good celebratory campaign with Equal Game, and it was then looking forward to the Euro 2020 as well, where the whole of Europe was coming together to stage the competition, that actually it was about time that, that we, went out to the football world and garnered opinion from people about discrimination, their personal experiences of it, and how they honestly and openly thought that we could change it and actually and football could be a vehicle for good. It's really important you say that actually because it, it's the people in the film, including Nadia, that, that really get to the heart of the story. That's, that's the whole point of it, hearing personal experiences to make you realize perhaps when you, we, you've not been aware of so much that, that's going on. I wonder how you felt, Nadia, when you were approached to do this. What, what made you want to uh, get involved in this documentary? Um, I thought it was a brilliant idea. Uh, you know, I thought that it was amazing that we're gonna create awareness about this topic because it's, it is there and it's such a 
big issue. And, you know, having UEFA and other footballers been involved in it to create the awareness and try to bring a change, I thought it was very, 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 very cool. And uh, obviously I was delighted to be a part of it, um, to send that message that discrimination does not belong in football. And, and, and we as footballers, we as clubs, you know, um, are against it. Uh, and I hope that's going to be, you know, um, that's a reminder to the people who love the sport that they are also going to take the stand and then and, and we yeah, can make a tiny bit of difference. Yeah, I, I don't just think a tiny bit of difference, actually. I think a, a film like this has the ability to make a powerful big difference, actually. And, and hearing your story in particular, for anybody listening to this session today who perhaps doesn't know your, your background, can, can, can you tell everybody exactly the, the, the journey you've been on? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, as you said, I'm a Danish striker, uh, but as you can see, I'm not really a typical Dane. Uh, it's because I was born in Afghanistan and uh, because of the war, because of my dad was killed, we had to flee the country. So I was a refugee uh, when I arrived in Denmark um, in 2000. And that's where I fell in love with the football. And, you know, and football has given me the life that I have today. And of course, like super grateful for that. Um, um, and, and, you know, it, it literally has changed my life to, to the better. And then, and so I'm every time we have the time, like um, every time that I'm approached to use football to bring a change or change point of views, it makes me happy because it has done it for me. And I want to bring that message to, to others. I love the fact, and it was beautifully animated in the film, which, which Tom, you use fantastic animation throughout for, for things that you can't actually show in historical moments. And just, just to bring a bit of a poignancy uh, to the documentary as well, it's really well done. But the moment, Nadia, where it's animated with you in the refugee camp, looking over to the, to the football pitch, watching people play, that moment where you actually went over to ask the coach whether you could take part, that must have been such a nerve wracking experience for you. But, but to get the response that you got must have, must have made you feel included. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I remember these really, really clear. And, you know, being a kid in a really new environment that you have no, you don't know anything. The only thing that you do understand is that this is a game and people are having fun and I really want to be a part of it. And, you know, and I think that day changed my life and it showed me how powerful the game is and, and how exclusive, uh, inclusive it can be, you know, it's for everyone. So at the refugee camp, there was these football fields just beside us. So I used to watch them uh, train and I've heard about football, haven't really watched it so much. One day, uh, I saw a girls' team play. At that moment, I think I knew I want to play football. And then one day, I was like, oh, I really kind of want to train the way they're doing. So I went and asked the coach, just went and asked if I could play. And he smiled, he's like, yeah, cool, get in. That's how I made like, my first Danish friends. You know, even though I didn't even speak the language, you don't really speak, but you still communicate with the ball. And that was the day that I was like, you know what, everything's possible. I, they don't know me. I can't play football, but he just let me in. And it didn't really, anything else didn't really matter. And, and, and I love that, you know, and that's the reason I love this, the game so much, you know, because it's, it's for everyone. And, and you don't really have to have anything with you. Just, yeah, if, a bit of courage to ask the question, can I be a part of it? <laughs> It's one of, I mean, that, that is one of the most powerful parts in the whole film, I think, um, because you've got this personal story from a 10 year old girl who has heard about football, but's never seen it and has gone to the fence of a refugee camp. And she's looking across and she's seeing these people playing football and she thinks, I want to play that game. I want to be involved. She is brave enough to go and ask. And then, as Nadia says in the film, I didn't speak Danish at all, you communicate through the ball. Mm. And that's how Nadia made friends in Denmark for the first time, through football, without being able to speak the language. And that is a clear example of showing the inclusivity of football and how a young refugee can actually integrate. 
Yeah, that's the power of football. It doesn't really matter, you know, your religion, background, the way you look, your opinions on the field, they don't really matter. It's just, you know, you have one common goal. That's like have fun and win the game, you know, and then all these differences, they kind of disappear. And, and and I think that's why it's one of the most popular games in the world. And I'm trying to use it to, to you know, to bring changes, I think is, is pretty awesome. And, and it does bring change as well. At, at the end of the film, Alexander Seferin, the UEFA president himself says football is school of life. We're the role models. And potentially he's suggesting football is the only industry that, that can create change in terms of discrimination. Do, do you feel as if that's the case, Nadia? Um, I don't know if it's the only industry. That's um, that's hard to to you know to say. But I know it's it has a big. It can play a really big role. I think it's an amazing tool. The reason it's, it's so amazing is because it's so widely accepted, you know, and it's so widely loved. So when you come across and saying as a footballer that you're like let's say one of the biggest football like Ronaldo Messi who is loved by millions if not billions of people if they can come out and say listen guys if what you do right now is wrong let don't do that you know I think that's gonna have a huge impact so so it is a is an amazing tool to educate people not like in, the, in any ways in life um so yeah and I, I lo- and I love that you know lately or the last decade we've been using sport and generally football more and more to do, you know, to do education because it's so easy to come in in people's lives um, because it's already there. And it's interesting because uh, Paul Pogba within this documentary talks about um, an incident that happened with him at Fiorentina where a father and a son were were abusing him from, from the sidelines and, and he was shocked and his way of, dealing with that was to go over and give them his shirt which they then accepted and started cheering for him which does show that there is powerful change available within football to 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 change these perceptions and and Tom you talked about the storytelling being at the heart of this documentary did did the end product evolve because of the stories that, that that you were hearing as you were going along uh yes it 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 did evolve I mean I think the original concept was really always to be a listening exercise. And UEFA were very, very open about this. They wanted to to go and hear what footballers, coaches, fans um, had to say about discrimination and their personal experiences of it. Um, Mm. So it was very much a a journey of discovery, actually. It wasn't a, this is the story we want to tell and this is the conclusion we will reach. It was um, a sort of light touch, if you like, to actually go and, and find out and listen to people and find out exactly what people had to say. And Nadia, for you, when did you know about Dayan Lovren's uh, story? Obviously, he was a refugee who, who had to flee Bosnia as a, as a three-year-old, doesn't remember much about it personally, but we see his family's story and them looking over photographs and, and discussing it. But were you aware of that before you took part? No, I wasn't. I was, uh, I was, yeah, in shock that he had like a similar experience, and 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 you know, amazing that how much football again has helped him, you know, and 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 brought him where he is. Um, so that was a yes, yeah, I was really surprised, and uh, and actually made me happy to see him. Um, and again, I think his story is is pow- really really powerful, and what we're trying to you know to tell through this documentary. And what was powerful, listen, you alluded to it at the start, we can't skip over it now because you talked about cursing in the documentary, (laughs) you did, and it made me laugh out loud because it's exactly what it is. It's up to you whether you say it or not. I might say it on your behalf and just apologise in in advance if anybody would be offended. Um, But the fact that you were making massive headlines, particularly in in the 2017 European Championship final, which, which Denmark made, uh, it upset some people within the country that you were making those kind of headlines, but but your response to that was uh, w- was quite quite amusing. I thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's such a topic that really touches my core. You know, and I get emotional. It's 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 hard not to get emotional because it's it's something that I have experienced all my life. You know, and and, and honestly, sometimes I don't really understand why 
like the way people are reacting towards me. And I think it was really clear during the Euros because I'm literally trying to win something for the country and, and I'm doing really well. And some of the leaders of the country or, or yeah, having pain in their butt. <laughs> and, 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 and it was annoying me. Um, and, you know, it's hard when you're like a, an athlete to, to react to these comments, you know, because usually I don't want to, I don't want to get involved in, in this kind of stuff. Uh, but it does affect you. And I think I had the opportunity to kind of tell them <laughs> what I, how I felt in documentary. So, that was, yeah, it felt nice. <laughs> but I think it, it also, I think it just also, you know, it, it shows Nadia's anger and passion. And that, I mean, that's so important. You know, I mean, <laughs> of course you should be angry if you're, if you're being discriminated against. Why, why yeah. wouldn't you be angry? Other people deal with it in different ways. You know, we talked about Paul Pogba, and that's a classic Paul Pogba reactions to go and, go and confront it with, with love. He's a, he's a very generous and giving person. Everyone reacts differently, but we sh- how can anyone tell anyone else how to react to, to how they yeah. get limited against? Honestly, I thought you were going to cut that part out. <laughs> also, <laughs> I was like, yeah, no worries. I can curse. They're going to cut it out anyway. So then we're going to make the screen. And we then I thought, I was like, wow. <laughs> huh? We fought hard to keep it, Nadia. Uh, good. <laughs> good. I'm glad you did. I, I, I thought it was one of the best parts of the documentary because it was just owning it completely like this positive, <laughs> amazing event is going on. And you're highlighting the fact that I'm from Afghanistan rather than the fact I'm playing for the Danish national team. And as you say, kicking ass, bitch. So, yeah, and <laughs> I wasn't going to say it again, but I think it's important to highlight <laughs> This is, you know, when you see Megan Rapino standing up, you know, making speeches like like she has done before, mm. it, it's crucial actually that the anger comes out slightly and the frustration and almost the ridiculousness of it. Yes, I think when that's highlighted, people sit back a little bit and think, "Oh, am I am I being ridiculous with this?" And it's like, well, everybody else can see you are. Yes, so perhaps you have to highlight it in that kind of way that is perhaps not palatable to, to some people, but is a gut and true reaction. Yes, definitely. I think it's important to, you know, to show that you know, what's been said actually affects people. You know, it hurts people. Uh, I think that's very, very important to make them aware that what you're doing actually is causing this, you know, and then is this what you want? Because I think a lot of people, you know, doing this discrimination, I think they are they are not aware of it. They're ignorant of what their action is going to do. And, you know, creating awareness about it and highlighting that is, 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 is important. I think at the end, if you understand that you're causing harm to someone else, most people would stop. Most people. There are sometimes some people who... who it will take a bit more to change change their point of views, but most people will say that's that's not right, that's not humane. It's interesting you say that because it, it's such a delicate area to to discuss, and and particularly across Europe as well, when there are so many different viewpoints over over discrimination, that it's important to highlight how different people are affected by it, um, how different people react to it as mm-hmm. well. And, and Tom, you you kind of have spoken about the, the storytelling aspect of it. Do you feel as if perhaps high profile players, uh, people within the football industry, coaches, et cetera, are more open to discussing things that have happened to them nowadays? Because it almost feels as if everybody feels more comfortable to say how they feel and actually are less worried about the consequences of what they feel because now everybody is saying, do you know what, this is this is not right anymore and we have to keep talking about it. I think that was one of the major things to come out of, of producing the documentary over what became an extended period of time due to COVID was that actually the willingness of people to talk about it and to talk about their personal experiences and actually to want to talk about it as well was was really powerful. And that came across throughout. I mean, for example, um, Paul Pogba, we've, we've mentioned, but we, we filmed a lot with Paul for this documentary and his he gave his time very freely, wanted to know exactly who else was in it. Um, another another person to sort of put, single out on that is, is Tyrone Mings, who... Um, the England international who'd suffered abuse at the Bulgaria game. Now he 
um, originally was, was reticent to, I think, talk about his personal experience, but actually once he found out about the project and wanted to actually have a phone call and a discussion before committing to it, then he fully committed to it. But there was an absolute willingness to understand the topic, where he would fit in with it, and then to properly engage with it and to really commit himself and his give his own personal views across. Yeah, and I, th I think now th there feels as if there's some power behind it as well, because I I've interviewed Tyrone before, and he was actually pushed in front of the media on the day that Greg Clark made his comments in, in the UK um, that, that didn't go down particularly well. And it was just ahead of an England press conference and Tyrone Mings was put in front. And you could tell he didn't want to have to be the spokesperson, if you like, to talk about it. But he was so eloquent and articulate in putting his view across when essentially he was, you know, talking about his boss, if you like, you know, <laughs> at, at the FA. And I think that was in itself incredibly powerful that you feel like you did, Nadia, that you could come out with politicians in Denmark and say, hold on a minute, this, this isn't acceptable anymore. It's not just fans in, in Stadia, it's, it's politicians, um, heads of organizations that you feel empowered to speak up against. Do, do you feel that? Um, yeah, definitely. I think, first of all, it's not always easy, you know, I think, yeah, again, it's such a delicate topic. And sometimes you don't really want to show that vulnerability towards other people. You don't want to show them that it hurts you because then you feel like they, they, they got what they, they want, you know. So most of the times I don't want to do it. But I thought, like, in this project, it was important to show that part of it. And then and again, I think the people who, the powerful people, they should be accountable for what they say and what how they react because they have an impact. You know, we're trying to have this positive impact, but some people purposely do or say stuff that have the opposite effect, you know, the negative impact. So so for me, I wanted to say that that you guys are doing this and you should be hold accountable, you know, and then and especially if you're such like, you know, a leader in, in, in the FA or a Danish politician who has, when they speak, so many people listen to them, you know? So yeah, it's, I think not always easy, but something has to be done. But when you speak, a lot of people listen now as well. And, and, visibility is so key and you have to be the pioneer of that in lots of ways because there will be many young girls from Afghanistan or other uh, refugees who look at your story and feel empowered by it themselves and, and look to you as a huge role model and it's not just in football that you're a role model either because you know you're, you're doing amazing things outside of football um are you qualified now as a, as a surgeon what's 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 the latest with your studies Thank you. um so yeah like not not done yet no just because uh, i'm middle of the season and i've i've hold the break to to concentrate fully on football before i finish my studies uh, so i'm doing my thesis right now um just on the site but as you said you know i think yeah i'm i'm luck lucky to have a platform where when i speak i do have you know some people listening and i think that's the key uh, that i've seen over the last couple of years more and more footballers do use their platform and their voice uh, to speak up because before that you'd be like oh you're an athlete just stick to the sport you know uh, but now you've you realized that yeah you're an athlete but you also like a member of this world society and if, and you want to you want to bring the change um and I, I love that i love that there are more and more athletes getting involved in you know uh, different courses how, how much pressure do you feel with that i don't feel any pressure zero i think uh, i feel i feel a need to use my voice I uh, I want to because I know it's going to help people. Uh, you know, I I want to create awareness uh, around the problems that we have, and there's so many. But any pressure? No, uh, I think there's maybe a like a tiny bit of obligation. I think if you you can do something, you should do it. Um, you don't have to, but I just feel that's in your power. You know, and and if you have the energy, why not? Uh, why would you not try to help? Um, that's just I don't know. Just logic thinking from my part of uh, yeah. side of part.
logical thinking for, for, for most people, I would, I would say, but unfortunately not for all. But one story that, that really shone for me, Tom, and, and I'd love to hear your perspective about what, what Guram was like to talk to, but Guram Kashia, the Georgia international who was Vitesse Arnhem uh, captain and, and came out in support of LGBTQI. What, what was it about his story that resonated so much? Because when I watched that, I had absolutely no idea what, what he'd been through. And when we're talking about discrimination within this film, it comes in in all all kinds of, of different forms. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say on that is it's actually very difficult to tell the, the, the LGBT story in men's football from a perspective of somebody who suffered it because there are so few out gay male players in history. So it's actually very difficult to, 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 to tell that story from the men's football point of view. Much easier in the women's game, of course, which is a, a reason for celebration. And there's a lot that the men's game can learn from the women's game. Um, so rather than going down the historical route of talking about Justin Fashionu, who was an English out gay player who tragically committed suicide due to the, the pressures that he felt, um, we, we spoke to Guram about you know, he's a, a, a straight male footballer, but he wore the captain's armband and LGBT armband, but suffered enormous amounts of homophobic abuse back in his native Georgia as a result of that. And he was, he could quite easily have brushed it under the carpet, ignored it. He didn't. He took a stand and he continued to take a stand. Incredibly difficult for him. All of his family were still living in Georgia. But he, he said, no, this is wrong. This is not right. Homophobia in the game is not right. So for a straight male player to do that and to continue to do that and to put his family at risk, to be on the headline news in his country shows an enormous belief in what is right in the game and what, what football can do and the power that he has. So I think he's an incredibly brave individual, actually. Yeah, certainly. And, and to be honest, I, I watched the entire documentary and felt that Nadia when, when when you watched it back again and and saw that the names involved in it as well and the fact that everybody was being so open with their stories and the fact that you're able to showcase it you, you talked about platforms earlier on and that you have a platform to do that but a platform like this on with so many standing together with their individual stories how powerful do you think that can potentially be very powerful, very. Uh, as you said, you know, uh, top athletes with big platforms, big following, uh, millions of people loving them, coming and telling, you know, their vulnerable stories about, like, you know, really, uh, like, you know, um, discrimination that they have they have experienced in their, their life lives. Um, I think it's, it's really powerful, and I hope, I really, really hope that, People take the time and you know watch the video and see, see uh, like these issues that do exist and and and, and not only <laughs> around the world but like are really really big problems in football world of football. Um, you know, um, so powerful. I think some of the stats were powerful as well, Tom. When, when many of them that came up, thirty nine percent of UK football fans surveyed have witnessed or heard an act of discrimination, sexist and, and homophobic abuse on the rise uh, across Europe. And it's important to, to make sure that people realize these stats and that it's a big problem. But the one that I also looked at, 400% increase in sexist discrimination. I mean, we're in 2021. I know there are some amazing, there are some amazing stats in there. And, and you know, globally 54% of fans have witnessed racist abuse. Whilst, whilst watching a professional football match. I mean, that's, that's an incredible stat as well. But I think, I think the thing about football is that obviously it's the biggest game in the world and we all know that. So it has an incredible power to, to help and to change. But the reason that it attracts this discrimination is also because it's the most powerful game in the world. It attracts the attention of the right people and also the wrong people but they are in a minority. And for me, actually, I think one of the most amazing stats in the whole of the documentary is that um, we spoke to some people at Stanford University who've done some research into Mo Salah joining Liverpool. And that 
Mo Salah joined Liverpool in June um, 2017. Since he's joined, there's been a 16% drop in anti-Muslim hate crimes on Merseyside. That's an amazing statistic that they, you know, and this is not just, this is academics at Stanford looking through millions of tweets, millions of articles. That shows that an individual going somewhere where they are unusual can affect human behavior and can affect discrimination. That's what can happen. Nadia, you look like you wanted to, to jump in with I, that. It's I love that. I knew, I, I love this fact, you know, and it, again, shows the, the power of football. You know, I, and I think at the end, I don't know, I just believe that, I believe in the good in the humans. I don't think there's a lot of people who would want to, you know, harm someone else intentionally. I think they do because it's like a part of the game. Let's, let's try to, you know, bully, uh, be mean to these people, so affect their game. You know, I think also that's a part of the football that people have been brought up to, but we have to bring that change and say, no, it's not okay. Maybe you don't really mean it, but it has an impact on the person receiving it. So, and, and, and you know, I don't know. I, I just feel again, by telling this again and again and again, and you know, and people taking a stand and telling them it's no right. I think slowly that culture of football um, might change. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. I don't think like if we do a one documentary and if we have four days of, you know, social media block. I think, I don't think that's going to be enough to do it right away. I think you just have to keep maintaining this, you know, this campaign of like, that it's no right. It's no right. It's no right. At some point it's going to become a point of like a, like a part of the culture, like that if someone does something that everyone's going to take the stand, you know, um, that if you, witness racism in the stands that everyone's going to be against that guy and you're not going to be like oh well i mean it's only football he doesn't mean it that way you understand what i mean so um, yeah it's 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 a longer i think it's a longer journey than than just uh, and this just started you know and i think it's gonna take a lot of time before we see the impact of it right away but every journey has to start somewhere and as you somewhere. say it's purely an awareness, I think, sometimes of people, as you suggested there, Nadia, is that, that, you know, they're jumping on a bandwagon. They don't really quite understand what it what it is that they're that they're doing or the impact that it has on people. And, and that's quite a positive note to, to end on in, in, in some ways uh, of where we go from here with this and the impact that documentaries like this can make going forward. So I just want to ask both of you. Uh, we'll start with you, Tom. How much are you hoping this documentary, everything that else that's going on, you know, we've seen the social media blackout recently, um, the fact that people are standing up and, and saying this is not acceptable anymore. How much are you hoping that football and society in general are going to start properly tackling these issues? I think the great thing about documentaries like this is it gets people talking. And I think it raises awareness of the issues. And I think that's the, the key point is that if we stop talking about them and we stop doing things like this or we don't do them, then we're part of the problem. And, and yeah. that's what Tyron Ming says in, it's brilliantly. If you're doing nothing, you're part of the problem. No one's pretending that, that one documentary from UEFA is going to change the world. Of course it isn't. But the fact that we're talking about it and, and raising the issue and keeping the issue at the front of everyone's minds is the most important part of it. So it's the very act of doing it, I think, that's important. And as, as the UEFA president says in the documentary, you know, UEFA does a lot, but we need to do more. He's talking about himself, he's talking about the organization, he's talking about clubs, he's talking about players, he's talking about governments. He's saying we all need to do more, but it's that acknowledgement that, that it's the start of the journey, if you like, and that, and that everyone, if everyone who wants to make change, does it together. That's incredibly powerful. It really is. Nadia, I want to give you the final thoughts of, of this session. Um, for you, what would make a more inclusive environment for everybody to, to, to operate in? And you talked about it being a journey. Where can you see and what is your hope for the final destination? Oh, wow, that's a big, big question. Um, 
you know, obviously, you know, what I'm fighting for is is to to educate people, uh, yeah, and and you know, kind of tell them that there is <laughs> all the hatred that hatred that you experience is because lack lack of education is just because of ignorance. You don't know better, and once you understand the other person, you understand their differences. You're not gonna be behaving this way, uh, and I think that's that's what i've been fighting for and that's why i've been using my voice for uh and football and i and i love i love the fact that you know uh, it's uh, you know the biggest people in football world are getting together to to do the same thing um and i'm i'm sure that is going to have a huge impact over time um but it's something that as tom was in um around that has to you have to maintain doing that um, because one of the hardest thing I feel is changing point uh, people's point of view. That's not going to happen overnight. It takes a lot of time. It does, but we're starting and documentaries like this certainly are, are helping. Thank you both so much for, for joining me. It's been it's been a delight to, to chat about this. Nadia, good luck for the Euros. Thank you. Next year. Uh, Tom, looking forward to see what Shoot the Company does next as well. And uh, I hope you all in, enjoyed this session. And if you've not seen the documentary yet, I urge you to download it.